You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. First item on the agenda are the minutes of December 6, 2023. Can I get a motion to accept, please? They were emailed to everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Kent. Uh, Kent and seconded by uh, Eric. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor? Carried. The next item is the uh, minutes of the December 20, 2023 meeting. We get a motion to accept, please. Diana, seconder. Chris, any discussion? All in favor? Carry. Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, correspondence. And. <clears throat> We have received a letter from a resident in the Whalebone area who is concerned about um, a secondary exit out of Whalebone in addition to Barrett Hill. Um, I have responded to, uh, to this person and the fire chief has also responded to him. Uh, you may hear more about this later on with the long range plan. But the uh, person also asked that it be noted on the agenda. So that's the reason it's being mentioned here now. Okay. Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, Communications Committee. So, Diana. Okay. Um, this is the beginning of what I would like to have as a communications policy. A draft of such was presented to the, um, via email to the rest of the trustees. I've been working on this uh, in order to uh, facilitate the um, access to information. Um, at one point, Derek had asked how he could clarify information quickly and competently, as opposed to asking for people um, to go to a meeting and talk about it and then come back to him. It slows everything down. So that was the beginning process of that. And then one has to start to look at whether it has to be a policy or a bylaw. And that reading has also become an extremely uh, interesting uh, process as to why you do one thing and why you do another thing and what's active and what's what's not and then the other thing is is that well why would we want to do this um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that as you see um, boards morph and change and grow over the course of the time that you're there and and when you came on and when you moved and when things have changed you also know that's going to happen once you've left that things are going to change when new people come on. So the things that you find that might work and might facilitate items and agendas and information and correcting information or disinformation, um, that makes it easier for a board of our size, which is actually considered small, um, things like the communications policy will come in handy because it can be somebody on the board or it can be a professional that can be hired when there's budget money that we can, do, that, uh, we can use to hire somebody. Having a professional do it means that they're in touch with an awful lot of the information uh, at the, their fingertips is what can be done immediately and what can has to go through a different process. So that is why we've ended up with this in front of us because there's an awful lot of times that we want to, uh, as quickly as possible, get information out in as many possible ways as we can that has clear and very concise information as to what's been done or why something has been done. And we thought this was the best way to do it. So would you like me to read the policy out? Yep. Okay. So the goal of this policy is to provide accurate, factual, and balanced information to the public at large with the use of a communications officer in conjunction with the chair of the board of trustees. 
the communications officer, with input from the chair, will maintain a strong working relationship with the chair of the board, ask for clarification and provide information to proper sources that will correct misinformation or disinformation, when deemed necessary, respond to incoming correspondence that contains errors of fact, omissions, or statements that may require clarification. Publish clarifications and corrections for public awareness in areas to be determined. Provide access to facilitate a connection or a timely avenue and method for the press to verify statements made. May post a monthly bulletin newsletter of the activities of the board in the newspaper and social media. The chair and the communications officer will provide updates to all trustees by all appropriate means and methods. Do you make a motion to accept that? Has everybody had a time, a chance to reread that and to think about it? So, if I can have a motion to accept this communications policy. Error, seconder. Charlene, any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the planning committee. Okay. Short. <clears throat> so, um, at our last uh, planning session, we came up with a draft for the survey to be put out to the public, which everybody I believe has a copy of mm -hmm. here and has, has worked out and participated in. Um, and so I would like to have a motion to accept this policy as presented, and I'd like a second motion to have money pay for the printing of it. So we could do that in two parts. This survey will go out in uh, to the general public on the website, and it will be available in a paper copy at the fire hall and at Wild Rose nursery for the public to pick up if they do not have access to computer. Uh, was that is, okay so you the motion make, the motion I want somebody to make I can make it but I can you know if it's better coming from somebody else to accept it. Sorry what were you gonna say John? Um, I'm not sure I should do this before the motion is made but I was just gonna ask how much money you were asking for for it's um, it's gonna be three hundred dollars to to print it's approximately a hundred dollars per hundred copies, so we're going to start off with a hundred copies. But if I need to print more because they all go, then I'd like to have some money in place that's just available to reprint. Could, could we just print it off the uh, printer here? There's four sides to it, and Jared, Jesse doesn't have a lot of time. It's, um, this is half the price of what Staples would cost to do it when I call it Staples. It would be with Gallery Press. Is it? We were also doing it online, right? So yeah, we're yeah, doing it online. So that's why a run of 100 copies only, and we may not need it. But if we need it, I don't want to have to call a special meeting of the board to ask for more money. So I'm trying to be proactive on that. Can we get copies of this at the library, too? Is it just that's these four pages? Those on the eight and a half by 11? It, yes, but there's crossword that's called it on eight. What the printing is going to be is on um, 11 by 17, and it's oh. going to be folded in half. So it's going to be two sides of 11 by 17, oh, so it's really just one piece of paper. I see. Okay. And okay, so can we have a motion? <clears throat> to accept the sur survey as it is to go up to the public. Yep. Okay. I have a seconder. Chris? Any discussion? Ken? Um, I think we talked about um, just the header part being, uh, instead of the Gabriel Volunteer Fire Department, it was going to be the, the Gabriel Fire Protection District okay. Board. Because we're balanced. the one. Yeah. yeah. So you want to amend the survey header? Yeah. Make that a motion. Is there a seconder for that motion? Second. Diana, any discussion? Okay, all in favor of the amendment? Carried. Um, 
for the discussion on the amended motion. I would just like it to be on the record that <clears throat> to the Long Range Planning Committee it has certain things in the Long Range Plan that we don't have any control over. So, for example, replacing trucks. This, the purpose of this survey is to get community input. So as we create the plan, we have community input, and this is the first, probably of what will be many steps to create the long range plan. Okay. Any other discussion on the survey? As amended, okay. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay, and then can we have a motion to have up to $300 spent for the printing of the survey if necessary. Okay, seconder. Diana, any other discussion? All in favor? Carried. Okay. The internal trustee emailing use policies. I have to, can I ask um, for something under the finance committee quickly? Um, it just goes back to the corporate communications officer. Because it's money. Um, so this is coming from the communications committee? Mm -hmm. Any objection? Okay, go ahead. Okay, I wanted the policy to pass before I did this. Um, because we will be looking at um, finding a way to um, set up a, a possible communications officer, and that will require funding at some point. At this point, uh, it seems to me that it, it can fall upon the, because they'd be working with the, with the, um, with someone in Paul's position right now, that it would fall on him to do the job if he accepts it, to work as the communications person at this time, until and when we have, are in a position to advertise and look for a corporate officer. Because we don't have the budgeting for it yet. Okay, so. You're doing most of it anyway. Go ahead. The chair. So, Paul. Would you, as the chair of the trustees, do the bulk of the work as the corporate office, as the uh, communications officer, until we are in a position to hire or assign that to another person? Yeah. Yeah. Could it be a board member? Well, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. But because he's done me most of the phone calling and everything mm -hmm. right now, too, it makes sense that. Yeah. You know, he's privy to most of the information. And then his job would be to, as we said, bring it back to us. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, um, back to the business email committee. Is there anything from you? No, I have almost finally finished um, the research and the, um, the, the draft draft of, of the working email policy, and I hope to have that out completely in order for us to vote on that at the next meeting. Okay. Next item is the election committee. Uh, the election committee was formed last fall to look at the policy, the improvement district policy with respect to elections. There is currently a policy in place. There are no significant changes in the new policy. What the new policy does is it includes in, in the form of appendix the various forms that are used during an election by the corporate officer. So, for example, the nomination forms, uh, the scrutineer forms, the basic format of the election, the procedures are not changed in this in the new policy. Um, the last two elections have been conducted using the forms. They seem to work quite well. 
So the pollen seed is being updated to that. Uh, everybody got a copy of the uh, election policy, and I would move for a motion to accept the policy. Eric, seconded. Chris, any discussion? So this just replaces the... This new policy replaces the policy that is currently in place, and basically this policy outlines in greater detail the procedure for the election. John? I just have a couple of questions about the wording. Um, just a second, I'm trying to find it here. Uh, um, it says on number seven of the process that the if a, one of the candidates dies, the election will be restarted. There's two other uh, conditions in which someone can stop being a candidate. So I'm just curious what the rationale for restarting only when they die would be. They can't withdraw it. They haven't legally withdrawn. So if they withdraw, we don't restart the elections. There's different. I'm sorry. If we, if it says that if if they withdraw or get removed, the election is not restarted. But if they die, it is. That's right. Okay, that's intentional. And, and where that comes from is the BC Elections Act. Okay. And the reason that it's in here is that the BC Elections Act does not apply to improve the districts. So that's why it's in here. So that's standard? Yep. Okay. Right, right now it's been the Elections Act, so. Okay. okay. Um, and a few more as well. Um, so we've got sort of part of the nomination process, we've got the eligibility for the candidate under number three, under nomination process. You've got sort of part of the eligibility in there, but then we don't really cover the eligibility of the nominee. It's all sort of covered in the form. And so I was gonna suggest that we just take the section from the form, the eligibility, and put it in the actual document itself as well. You could have it on the form as well. It just, I think it's just better practice to have the eligibility of both the form and on the actual document. <clears throat> That's just a comment. Um, under the scrutineer. Okay, just hang on just before you go. We're going to change this policy. You want to amend the policy? Yes, yeah, so if you look at the form for <clears throat> the nomination, the nominee, and the, um, the candidate, sorry, the nominator and the candidate, if you look at the form for that, it's got, you know, the election eligibility stuff in there. On the form it says what, what it makes, takes to make you eligible to be a nominator and a candidate. But that's not really um, fully laid out in the document. So I would just recommend taking that and putting it on the document as well as the form. Okay, so that's an amendment to the motion to accept this. Is there a seconder for the amendment? Chris? Yeah. Okay, Diana? Um, I, I'm just trying to remem remember if we did that because some things page two. don't change oh, and other things do change, so it's easy to change the form and it is to change the policy. Is that why that was decided? I don't honestly know. I do know that this uh, document went to uh, the lawyer, and the lawyer has looked at it and basically approved it. So I yeah. can't honestly answer that question. Well, it's, it's not making any changes to it. It's just um, kind of moving the information to two places is all. Well, so it's not really changing the content of it. Uh, I'm sure all that candidacy stuff is, you know, from the Elections Act anyway. Okay, so. Anyway. Before you move on to the next one, okay. we've got a motion to amend the nominator form and... Well, it's not the form, it's the actual policy. I'll like the nomination process of the policy to add the eligibility 
for the nominator and the candidate in the election policy. Okay. Just copy that in the form, essentially. Okay, so we're going to vote on that amendment. Is there any other discussion on it? Okay. So can we have a vote on the amendment? All in favor? Carried. Okay, what's your second one, gentlemen? Um, I just had a question. I wasn't really sure under scrutineers what number two meant. It says, uh, if more than one scrutineer is appointed, the times between which the duties shall be performed shall be noted. I wasn't clear on what that meant. That means that an individual has three or four scrutineers. You can't have three or four scrutineers in the polling station. So they, <clears throat> when they complete the form, the form says what times they can act as scrutineers. Basically, the scrutineers have to take shifts. If you want more than one scrutineer during an eight-hour day, oh, that's, that's yeah. okay. because only one scrutineer, only each can only have one scrutineer in the polling station. Mean 10 at one time. And the next one, 10. 12. 10. Okay. okay. And that's actually happened in the last couple of elections where mm -hmm. one candidate, for whatever reason, couldn't get a scrutineer to spend here the whole time the polls were open. So they got two or three. So the times need to be indicated. Okay. That's, that's fine then, I think. Um, on page 18. I just wasn't clear who was signing this. It's a declaration. So, so I'm just not clear who's signing it. Is that for the scrutineer? Not signed at all. What's it supposed to be for? Well, if you look at page 18, it looks like it's a declaration, but it doesn't really say who's supposed to sign it. It's just got a name. It's like. Is it the scrutineer? Is it the candidate? I wasn't oh, clear who was supposed to be signing that. It, it just doesn't say what position. I'm sorry, I, you guys are going to have to yell because I can't hear you. Well, on page 18, it's like a declaration. Right. But it's, it doesn't say who is signing it. Is it the candidate? Is it the nominee? Is it. I'm not clear on that. Is it Jesse? So, it's two. a sample form that relates back to the policy. So, under voting on page 5. It's talking about the poll clerk shall be appointed, so it's a poll clerk that would sign that solemn decoration. And then, then it says the right form yeah, in the policy that references to that. So that's only for the poll clerk, this, this form. Okay. And it'll attach to the next appendix form F, which is right beside it, which is the poll clerk approval forms. It's supposed to. I guess we could just. Add that title to the form. Yeah, maybe just add that to the form and then it'll be clear. So I'll make that motion to amend the. You want to uh, amend appendix uh, B? Form e. 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 Form E. Okay. Just to say, uh, okay. poll clerk, was that what it was? Yes. Poll clerk. Oh, poll poll clerk declaration. Yeah. Seconder for that motion? Eric, any other discussion? All in favor? Carry. Okay, that was all my notes. Does anybody have anything else? Could I then get a motion, please, to accept the election policy as amended? Eric, seconder. Kent, all in favor? Carry. Thank you. Our chief's report. Welcome, everyone. All right, so another busy month for the month of January. Um, calls were 58 in total. Breaks down as follows 42 first responders, three MDIs, one miscellaneous fire, two hydro related, five wires down, and two gas spills, three alarms activated. 
2020, the stats from 2023 finally came in and we saw 562 calls for our busiest year ever. And we also saw our busiest month ever at 86 calls. So a big thanks to our membership for the dedication that they put in and training and all the efforts that go, goes towards reaching that call volume and maintaining that high level of service. Uh, the UMBC grant, uh, training grant that we got, uh, we were successful for the 30,000, which uh, will purchase four new SCBAs. Um, the grant came at perfect timing. We were able to lock in the SCBAs with a 5% savings in the end of December. Um, so, and best of all, those SCBAs have arrived and now are in service. So a big thanks to Oliver Bustler for writing that grant and uh, requesting more, more money for the improvement industry. Uh, Deputy Fire Chief. So we pushed for uh, the deputy previously. Um, we've tried uh, reallocating budget to make it work and we've advertised it throughout the province. Uh, we've advertised it locally. Um, when it came down to recruiting a deputy, they, we had very qualified candidates that refused the pay. So we've gone back to the drawing board and the big thing we need is we need to ask the trustees for, to unlock some of the money that we earned over deployment. So I'd ask that the trustees unlock 26,000 to give a possible salary of 75,000, which would be a base salary for a deputy. This deputy position would be a full time. The recommendations were noted in our operational review by Jay Brownlee, suggesting that we should have a full-time deputy as well as a training officer. So I think the most important group next is to try to acquire a full-time deputy. We were trying to use part-time funding, and it wasn't. We're not going to sequester the right deputy that's going to want to work full-time or move to Gabriola for a part-time wage. So like to go back and, and ask the trustees for a motion on that. Okay. I'll have to wait till the end of the I'll wait till the end of the report for that. Um, our, um, our new engine, a little update on that. So uh, the engine was approved for our urban interface engine. Um, so this will be built by Fort Gary. I had the first meeting with their uh, design and engineering staff. We looked at the design and did a, a, a follow-up. We did a meeting to just follow up on the design. Uh, we checked in. Chassis is going to be shipped to Fort Gary for August 2024. And the truck should be uh, finished production in August of 2025 when we will Hopefully we're seeing it back on Gabriola here. So we're looking forward to that. Um, it's going to be a very capable uh, wildland engine. It's going to serve two purposes. Uh, one primarily as a bush truck, which will be able to go into our, inter our interface and into our forest lands. As well, it will be a certified engine for our superior tanker accreditation and getting our FUS st status. So those are all great, great things we're looking to. Um, little update, so our 10 years is up for our superior shuttle accreditation. So we'll have to research on that. We'll have to research on the commercial status as well as the residential. Just a reminder that Gabriel has got the best um, residential rating you can get with the superior tanker accreditation, which, which is a C3. Um, so we're, we're quite proud of that and we look to to recertify here at the end of March. We're pushing for a Saturday, probably in, end of March. So training's begun and <coughs> membership's getting ready for, uh, for that day. Um, we congratulated the new platoon leaders. So they're the lieutenants. We've got four lieutenants in total that are, are leading those platoons. Um, and we're excited they're running now at the end of the the end of the month, they run one practice that's just in the platoon, and they're really doing follow-up follow up with the platoons, make sure that they've got adequate support 
uh, we did our first uh, platoon practice and it was a great success. So a big thanks to the uh, lieutenants that have stepped up and they're providing that leadership. Good. On a, on a, on a more frustrating note, um, our fire department works very hard to support the level of service that we do. Um, our community members come out um, three, four o'clock in the morning to support this department. And I'm all for uh, freedom of information reports and freedom of information and information getting out to the public. But there's nothing more frustrating than when our budget starts to get sacrificed and our level of service is gonna get is gonna start sacrificing as well as our membership's morale as the uh, attacks continue on the, on the improvement district and their fire department. So I would ask that the community start to attend these meetings and they start figuring out what's going on because this, uh, this can't happen when we've got such a strong fire department and we've got all these volunteer trustees that dedicate their time to making this a strong improvement district and strong department. So, yeah, I just ask the community to get involved and know what's going on. And I thank Gabriela TV for being here and Gabriela Sounder. A little training report. So I'm also acting as a training officer as well. Um, we're happy to have released a new 24 months training schedule. That was another operational review item that we, uh, that we've We've straightened out and we look forward to this 24 month calendar, which breaks down into two years because a one year training plan can't cover all the disciplines that volunteer firefighters have to cover. So with all the medical and all the driver training, um, live fire, all those disciplines, uh, technical rescue, all those disciplines that go in, we need a 24 month schedule. So. It's, it's succeeding nicely, and a big thanks to the officers for supporting it, and they're helping out and conducting a lot of the training. Um, some things we're looking, some training we're looking forward to is uh, we have an uh, engine boss course in Harrington on March 23rd. We'll be sending two of our trucks and five of our members. This is wildfire tra training, getting our members ready for this coming wildfire season. Gives them the ability to lead a, an engine company at a, at a wildland fire. So great training. We've, we've previously been at ones in Campbell River. Um, and officer training. So the officers have dedicated a lot of this, this winter and coming spring to their officers courses. So we have six officers in the officer one training and we have two of our captains in the officer two training. So a big thanks to, uh, to those officers for, for stepping up to the need. All right, thanks everyone. Did you want a motion for some? Yeah, and I would like a motion for $26,000 to be unlocked from the um, deployment funds to support that. Can I just say something to Will before we go into the motions? Um, first of all, the two years to build a, a truck is normal, right? Yeah, it's about 18 months. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which is, so we're always planning ahead to make sure that, that we're looking at where we're going with that and then that those are all built into the long range plan as well. So we always know ahead of time which ones are coming. And you, I know, have a rubric already set up with all those timelines on it. Mm -hmm. um, so we always know ahead of time. And then the other thing I keep trying to tell people about the, what's it called, FUS? Yeah, so the fire underwriter study. Yeah. Um, when it comes to insurance, when I heard about it the first time uh, and went to find out, I saved, well, my husband didn't like, uh, saved $400 on our insurance because of it. And I pay 200 and a bit in taxes to the fire hall. So I say the whole entirety of what I pay in taxes in what I say by having this underwriters thing. So please pass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll pass. Can we do it too? <laughs> yeah. 
So it's, yeah, I know it's an awful lot of work too. And are there any of the trucks that you need to have for that? Is it just the pumpers or is it just the... Well, the full tender fleet of four senders will be running that day and the frontline engine and then the backup engine will be in the backup role ready to support it when another call comes in. And then the new truck that's coming, is that the one that can also be deployed to fight wildfires if it's needed? I don't think it would deploy it. It's so integral to protecting the island safety. We okay. won't let it leave the island, or at least not in the first But years. it would release another truck to be deployed easier, and then that, of course, brings funding back into the Possibility. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, the chief has asked for a motion to release twenty-six thousand uh, dollars from the deployment. I lost the funds. Deployment. 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 Thank you. Deployment funds. Okay, Eric's going to make a motion. Do we have a seconder? John, any discussion? That this is money that we need to try to attract. Uh, Assistant Fire Chief, because what we tried at about 50,000 didn't work, yeah. and um, we yes. need to have an Assistant Fire Chief, and um, it's money that is unallocated at this point, and it will only be spent if we're successful in finding a Assistant Fire Chief. Yeah. And just to really stress the importance of the, all the new requirements that fire departments are going through, so work safe requirements with the structural firefighting minimum standards that we have to use by. So that's training standards as well as all the FUS and um, superior shuttle accreditation stuff that we need to keep up. All the training that we need to keep up our medical responders. All this load falls on myself and it's, it's, it's just too much. I'm barely coping right now. So I just want to stress how important that is. I don't think you'll see any fire department in the RDN that doesn't have a deputy. I think the only one right now is currently in use, but they're just in the process of hiring one. I checked in with the fire services advisor, which you're again. So I don't think there's many departments that where the chief is just acting. Especially with our call rate as well. Yeah, call volume. Yeah. And you, that uh, 75,000 number is. Uh, is uh, pretty pretty standard in the other fire departments. It's quite low, but I think that's where we need to start. Yeah. Um, we can look at next year's budget. I think we need, really, we'll try to do the best we can with the lowest amount, but at least that's a base full-time wage. To be clear, we do have the money mm -hmm. from the, uh, like if we, didn't, we didn't account for the additional funds in the budget, for this year, but uh, like Will pointed out, there is the remainder of the deployment money that we can tap into. And I imagine it'll, Jesse actually pointed out that it probably would take a few months to get this person. So, you know, we are technically not spending the money that we did allocate for the person right now, yeah. because we couldn't get anyone to take it for that salary. Uh, so between those two, I'm confident that we have enough money to allocate from six thousand additional dollars to us. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion? Carried. All right. The next item on the agenda is Privacy Act requests. And, uh, this is a report to the community. The Gabriel Fire Protection Improvement District is required to comply with the Freedom of Information and uh, Protection of Privacy Act. This act is administered by the Office of the Information and Privacy Commission, otherwise known as the OIPC. The act requires that, quote, the head of the body, quote, as noted in the legislation, is identified. In our case, it's the chair. The Act specifies the following. The maximum charge for any FOI request is $10. The first three hours of searching are not billable. Should any material not be in electronic format and need to be photocopied, a fee may be levied. 
Every attempt should be made to release information in electronic format, and redacting costs of the document are borne by the board. The procedure for an FOI request, a person applies for information, and once the $10 fee is received, a cursory search is done for the information requested. This results in a cost estimate for the production of the documents. The cost is then forwarded to the applicant or the person who's requested the information, the requestee. And once a response is received from them, action based on that response is taken. Either the request is completed or abandoned. Here's a review of Freedom of Information Act requests received as of Friday, February 2nd, 2024. The first request in the history of the Fire Department and Improvement District was received in May 2022. One early request resulted in 900 pages of documents being released. The last, recruit, the last request was received on February 1st, 2024. A total of four people have made requests. Three of these folks have had their issues resolved. One individual has made nine FOI requests. In addition, made a further 14 requests for information via email and has submitted to the office in excess of 40 emails. Of note, in the nine FOI requests for information submitted, there are usually two or three bullet points, and in those bullet points are more requests. Most of the responses provided have resulted in a complaint to the OIPC by the applicant and an investigation has resulted. As a result of the investigation, some requests have been modified. Once the OIPC is involved, that increases the time it takes to resolve the request as all material must go to Victoria for review. These requests have been for documents that are in some cases are in excess of 20 years old and or expired. The effects of these requests, all of these requests have had a negative impact on the board, the corporate officer, and the fire department. Some examples are, impeded, they have impeded the training of the new corporate officer. They have delayed implementation of new accounting procedures. It has resulted in increased and unbudgeted costs in the form of fees and overtime. It has caused harm to the board and the fire department in that this information has been published and the board cannot respond to that information due to the confidentiality restrictions. The response of the board. The board has made multiple requests to have a meeting with this individual in order to facilitate the resolution of the issues they may have. When the initial requests were received, the board did not charge the $10 fee. Charges were levied for photocopying. There is no provision to charge for time redacting documents. Over the course of the last many months, hundreds of volunteer hours have been spent dealing with these requests. These requests have strained relations between contractors and the GFPID. The board has dealt, dealt with seven different investigators at the OIPC thus far. Requests have been made to have one investigator at the OIPC deal with this individual and the related requests. To date, we have not had a response. The matter of frivolous and vexatious requests has been addressed twice to the OIPC who has advised, quote, you're not there yet, unquote. On December 11, 2023, the board held an in-camera meeting to discuss this issue. While the standard for in-camera meetings are for legal, land, and personnel, 
This meeting was held in camera due to the confidentiality requirements of the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act. The negative impact that these FOI requests was having on the operations of the fire department were reviewed. Given the nature and volume of work these requests were having, inquiries were conducted prior to the meeting on where to get some assistance. Discussion, was, discussion ensued and it was decided to hire a firm called Privacy Works. The cost of this firm is roughly one-third the cost of a lawyer. It should be noted that the use of Privacy Works will not totally relieve the pressure on the corporate officer because she will still have to find the documents in question, but it will relieve both myself and the corporate officer of trying to keep up with the ongoing evolution of what can and cannot be legally re released or redacted. They will also create the necessary correspondence and deal with the Privacy Commissioner. As of February 5th, 2024, the Board has spent $4,526 for the services of Privacy Works. Any comments from the Board? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda, I knew I was going to do this, is the AGM. And we um, are considering uh, for the board Wednesday, April 24th, 2024, for the AGM. I would move that a motion be made for that date. For the AGM. Charlene, a second. Uh, Ken, any discussion? When's Easter? I'm sorry? When is Easter? Uh, Easter's the last weekend in March. Okay. Um, and the uh, procedure will be the same. The election will be held uh, during the day and um, we'll have the AGM at night or that once the polls close and we'll follow the procedure with respect to notifications and whatnot as outlined in our letters back. But this will give everybody advance notice of when the election and the AGM will count. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried. Does any of the board have any late items? Diana, any objection? What's your item? Um, it just because of what you just brought up. With. Any objection from the board for the late item? It's fast. It's funny. <laughs> okay. Carry okay. on. Diana. Sorry, there's camera. It must be theater. Mm -hmm. um, every once in a while, things throw up their 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 heads, and every time that happens, this thing comes into my mind, and I'm really happy that it, I have found it. And there are people here that I think have not maybe seen this or heard this before. And I think it's always really good to put out there. Somebody used the word ghosting to me the other day. And I don't think it was the way it is when you're dating and you get ghosted. It was something different. So I thought, well, this is really good. And this has to do with the history of the fire department starting way back in 1967 when I was not so old. And it started because they decided to have a formal fire department. And this is an article, and for those of you that are really interested, apparently there is a place in the museum that has a, a whole lack of historical um, information about the fire department from way back. So I'm very good, quickly going to read this out. And I think this is great because it's going to go out. And it's the kind of thing that helps to stop people from talking about stories that are gone, dead, don't need to be talked about anymore. So, it seems that petitions have been following the fire department since the beginning. Gabriel is first fire protection district in 1967. The informal group of volunteer firefighters on Gabriel acquired an old fire truck from Diamond Improvement District. That's where their first truck. An official Gabriel fire protection district was first proposed that year, and as always on this island, controversy, rumors, uh, hidden agendas abounded. 
A special notice to Gabriel Ratepayers, re Gabriel of Fire Protection District, appeared in the Sandstone News in September 1967. Must have been way before Chris and yeah. Steve. In recent weeks, rumors have been circulating the island that the proposed Fire Protection District is A, hiding other local improvements behind the fire protection, and B, making an installation costing $40,000. Neither of these statements are fact. Your organizing committee, when circulating the petition, will seek your consent to apply to the provincial government for letters patent to incorporate our district for fire protection only. Now this is interesting because some other improvement districts do do more than just fire, but we, we don't. Only. The length of the island precludes a single fire hall, and some costs will be high because of the duplication. For example, land, fire halls, and alarm systems. And this is something I want people to keep in the back of their heads, please, because we do have maintenance costs coming up for the second hall. And that is ongoing, and we do need it, see? They said so. In May 1968, 35 men and women adopted a constitution for the fire department. It's training to be organized under Lieutenant Tom McDonald of the Nanaimo Fire Department 7. Harrison Burke, Burkholder, was elected as chief, and Jerry Rowan and Ted Eastholm, oh, those are familiar names, as captains. Volunteers raised money to pay for and maintain their fire truck, planning to hand it and its equipment over to an incorporated fire district when it was formed. However, a referendum that summer about forming Gabriel of Fire Protection District failed. People at the north end of the island, this north end, not the other north end, voted 147 to 42 in favor, but those at the south end voted 73 to 23 against. After two years of conflict amidst petitions and counterpetitions, the North Gabriola Fire Protection District was established by a plebiscite in August of 1969. 187 to 47 in favor, as reported in the Sandstone News. The district covered only the portion of Gabriola lying north of the line drawn from the top of Brickyard Hill Road in the west to the center of the island on the Gulf side. Victoria notified the North Gabriola Fire Protection District that their equipment could not be moved out of their own district, except by Civil Defense or Department of Forestry though nothing could prevent the individual firefighters helping to fight a fire outside the district. Peter Boer, another familiar name, told me that when there was a fire at the south end, they would take the fire truck to the edge of the territory and chuck all the gear into the back of the truck and just go fight the fire unofficially. Betty Castell, who arrived in Gabriel in 1967, said in a taped interview that she remembers thinking this north-south division was absurd, saying this island is three miles wide, 10 miles long, and they have a division. <laughs> so I think we're doing a good job. I'd like to put those on the website, sir. If you want a copy? Yes, please. Uh, just to, to correct a, an error, I'm not an error, an omission on my part. Uh, the AGM is uh, set for August 24th, like I mentioned, in voting hours. Are, uh, plan for noon to 7 p.m. So that would be the same as we did last April. 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 You said August. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> April. Let's try this again. April 24th. Noon till 7. Noon till 7 would be the voting, and at 7 would be the AGM. Got it right that time, right? Okay. All right. Um, so that's that. Any other late items? Any comments from the public? Liz? I was just going to say, the Sandstone News, uh, Gary McCollum was the guy that did the Sandstone News, and I've got a whole bunch of them here that Marshall McKenzie has tons of them. I'm trying to get her to put them in the, in in the museum. museum. But there was an emergency vehicle for Gabriel, and so they got a, a Buick Roadmaster, and that was Mr. Tom, Mr. D. Mate. <laughs> but anyways, it's a clearly be sure to indicate that it's, uh, well, this is what the end was fun. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, it, it's that would be interesting to see. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for, for doing that. Yeah, oh, I loved it. I just thought it was great. Yeah. 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 The more things change, the more things. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
amount of weight. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes prudence takes over. Right. Hey, are there any other questions? Just, yes. just a quick one. And this is fire hall one, correct? Yes. yes. And fire hall two is that building or no, the south hall? South hall. And Gertie is operating under that building? Out of the old fire hall. Okay, so that's, I'm just trying to figure out from different records, that's the old fire hall, that's the correct designation for the like, plate. When I read the old fire hall, that's the building I can understand. Thank you. Any other questions? Need a motion to adjourn, please. <coughs> Sharp, seconded by John. All in favor? Carried. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.